Hello, Welcome everyone. along. Please make a lot of noise to welcome the one and only Maya. All right. How are you feeling? Really hungover. <laughs> but bear with me and hopefully I have some Red Bull and feel better. Yeah. <laughs> where, where have you just come in from? Uh, New York. I just did two shows at Terminal 5 in New York City and um, just flew in now. Right. And yeah, I have a show tonight, obviously. Um, so I'm a little bit hungover. Yeah. And it's, I mean, you're massive in New York right now. How's um, that? It was, well, I just kicked off the tour. I'm like touring until December. And it was like the start of my, um, like a new set thing that I've made. I use the Lima machine. What's that? Uh, it's like, um, it's kind of a sync machine, so you do videos and samples yourself and you could trigger stuff. And it's like got a touch screen and you could do effects on it and stuff like that. It's just kind of simplifying the show, so, but kind of complicating it a little bit. So it's just a little bit more than a DJ. And, um, but you know, I have controls over the visuals and stuff, which is cool. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, it's like the first two shows doing this new setup. So we're so. gonna see that tonight. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Though my DJ really hates it. He said he's gonna smash it. <laughs> yeah. And what's the it setup? The show is it DJ and you or is it? Yeah, I still have um, low budget. Who is the other half of Holotronics from Philadelphia? And yeah, the Lima Machine, and me and Cherry. Yeah, I couldn't get visas for anyone else. Like the people that I wanted to recruit in my band were like sort of in the jungles in Congo and stuff like that and like random people. And yeah, getting visas for me is hard enough and trying to sort of get people out from India or, you know, Africa or whatever is, is 10 times hard. I was just um, checking out some chart figures. I didn't realize that you've been in the top 10 consistently in Canada. It's no wonder that. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, you <laughs> have. And um, I think the current, what's the current single you got out at the moment? Um, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure here. Um, I think in London it's Jimmy mm -hmm. and Japan is Jimmy and stuff. But in some places it's boys. Some It's just so random. I, I have like, I'm signed to an independent label in London and then a major in, in the US and I think like the communication between those two uh, is just so, it doesn't really exist. So they they kind of do their own thing and I, you know, meanwhile I sort of put stuff up on MySpace and I do my own thing and it's like there's about eight people doing their own thing with my stuff. So. Yeah, it's not very regulated. And what's the current album called? Kala. Do you want to play us something off it? <laughs> this is really strange. Right. Um, <laughs> I'm going to play... I kind of want it to make sense, like, what I'm talking about and stuff. So I think I, think I should do, like, an introduction to the album. This is obviously the second album. And um, I didn't really have any ideas about what it was about and what I was going to make it on and stuff like that. All I knew is, um, right, before I get into my album, should I start from the top about my first thought, like a musical thought about what I was going to do for my second album. So I heard this Tamil song a long time ago. Uh, I think it came out in... 1995 and I thought it was really amazing and I wanted to track down this producer but before I did I before I did all this stuff I was still touring a ruler so I sent this track in to Interscope and you know I was like this is what I want to do I want to do this sort of sound and I want to meet this guy da -da -da -da. and 
I think people were really inspired by it and it really sounds similar to Gwen Stefani's Wind It Up track. So I was really pissed and had a huge fight and stuff. Um, so this was the track. Really bad quality because I ripped it off a video. You get the idea. So that was like the first song that I thought I really liked and I wanted to find the guy who produced that. And then when when it kind of, you know, Gwen Stefani put out Wind It Up like the next week, I was really pissed about it. And so I decided to kind of not go with something, you know, that, that sound, that had that sort of vibe. And I went to meet the producer anyway, and we worked on a few things. And he's like the Timberland of Tamil Nadu, like down south. His name is A.R. Rahman. And he's this guy, he's just like his knowledge in music is so vast, like for where he is and what he does and stuff. And he's got this studio that's like an 11 million pound. Abbey Road kind of looking thing that he had people from Abbey Road design and stuff in the middle of Chennai with like 800 million starving people <coughs> and he owns the whole road and stuff and I you know when I got there I kind of decided that sort of on the way there and stuff I was meeting random people who were doing music that, that really didn't come from such an established like musical place in India. And they were just sort of experimenting and kind of, kind of I don't know, figuring out w what, what music is even, because everything is so sort of limited and you can only put music out through movies and stuff. And, and that's kind of where I, where I arrived at Bird Flu. So it was that week that I went to meet this guy and, you know, I figured that uh, Indian people, when they make music, they have like 79 different scales. And in the West, we only have two. And um, so it opened up so many possibilities. And then I just started rounding people up, you know, whoever, whoever kind of screamed the loudest in the street. And if the kids were playing, like whoever was like, you know, just there and was the feistiest, I suppose, that kind of made me work with them. And so that's how I met the kids and that's how Bird Flu came about. It was the idea of, you know, if if in the West um, we only made beats like in a 4-4 structure or used two scales and stuff, and in the East, like, they, ha they had, like, you know, such complicated mathematics of how they interpret music and how they make music and... They have all these half scales and stuff. And I just kind of wondered if India was becoming like tech, like technology wise as a superpower because they were getting all the sort of work to manufacture computers and manufacture the software and manufacture like everything enough to make, you know, they can make a Timberland album with exactly the same software and exactly the same equipment and stuff but probably, you know, 100th percent cheaper or whatever. You know what I mean? It, it just, I don't know. I started thinking it, it's a, a real special time to be in India because they just floated the market and stuff. And it was like a really big, like, economic boom. And they were really excited at the fact that they were making computers and making softwares. And if you make logic knowing that there's, like, 79 scales in music, then 
it would definitely change how we make music over here, you know, whether we know it or not. And that that's why Bird Flu is a big... <laughs> so that, that Bird Flu song is just basically, um, you know, in the end we kind of got AR Arm and the producer that I was supposed to work with, he gave me a contact to uh, his, you know, musicians basically. So I had like unlimited um, amount of people that I could access that whether, you know, whatever instrument I wanted and real, real like amazing talented musicians and real muso musicians. And, um, but I kind of sat up in the cupboard and I didn't really work at his studio and and I worked at his like auntie's studio. And um, it was just like a little room and they had like one, you know, monitor speaker put in there for us. And, and there was like thousands of cockroaches and stuff. And it was really, really run down and no one really used that building. But we were just in there because we, we didn't want to, like if you go to the posh, when they make music in India, if you go to the posh recording studios or any recording studios, it's like, um, a real spiritual thing. Music's like a really important spiritual gift from the gods type thing. And you have to take your shoes off and you have to be really respectful. And you know, it's like, a, you, it's almost like working in a temple. And um, so it was really difficult because I was with Dave Switch and Dave, I don't know how to say it, but he consumes a lot of beer. <laughs> I think he has like a bottle of beer a minute or something. So it was just like loading up empty bottles, like in this half of the studio takes up like, you know, anyway, the point is, so to have like the chaos and stuff, which me and Dave have when we make music, like we need the chaos. We need anyone to be able to like walk in and walk out and we need to be able to smash a few things, break a few things, you know, set fire to some shit. And that kind of chaos, it was really impossible to get in a really nice clean place. So I think I think Bird Flu probably has like it's a bit it's a bit dirty because of that, you know? Like you, you turn your head and there's like a thousand cockroaches that have eaten your lead and stuff. And it it's really makeshift that that whole song kind of reminds me of that. And then and then when we ma made the video we tried to sort of capture that whole thing. And was most of the record recorded in India then? No, what I did is um, I, I started it off with Bird Flu, but what I wanted to do was just basically build the skeletons in India. So I had the 505 there. And so I was playing stuff and getting real musicians to play stuff back to me. So, you know, most of the time when you make music, you, you start off with... Um, like an organic sound, you know, you play the instruments, then you put it into Logic and you, you, you make it sound more digital, you know, or it ends up that way by the time you finish. So I wanted to take something really like synthy and digital and really fucked up and glitchy sounding on the 505 and then get like real musicians to play it on their like coconut violins and weird instruments that they'd made that, that was really organic. And I felt when I was in India, just dance music and generally in like hot club culture, that where we were at at the time, it was all going towards that whole like justy sound, you know, which is where we are now. And everything's like a four four beat, and um, it's just sort of bringing back that boom, cha, boom, you know, sound that I think in England I've always related it to like a real like IB three kind of thing, you know what I mean? And when when the new kids were picking up on that sound and bringing it back, I just I just felt like it was really important to bring something really organic to it again. And you know, if you had like a hundred producers who are going to go and do that sound in the next like year or a year or two, someone has to be in in the game and sort of fuck it up and bring other elements to the pot. And I think it's all right to try and go to India and dig up like 30 drummers from a village, you know, like there were, there were funeral drummers and stuff and get them to make music for the dance floor here. Just to 
just to sort of keep it moving. And um, so that's how it started. So I recorded all the core sort of instruments there. And then at that time, Dave wasn't there. And I went to Trinidad and Dave met me there. And we started putting it together there. So I think the first sort of like main songs, apart from Bird Blue, the first sort of four or five songs came out of that. And we made Boys there. And you may, I mean, you're mentioning Dave, Dave Switch, who's a producer from the UK. I know that's a very significant working relationship for you. I'm just um, assuming you all know yeah, like everything. I, I think <laughs> that for those of us in the room that don't know who Dave is, do you want to fill us in on Switch Productions and, and how significant that has been to your albums? Um, Switch initially made a track of my old album, which is um, Pull Up The People, this one. I'm going to keep all my songs really short because it's just a bit weird. <laughs> but anyway, Switch is a house DJ. Um, he's a house producer and kind of originally comes from that sort of background. And this is the first time I worked with him is when I went in to record the song. And I don't know, he, it, like, for, for England at the time when I was making this album, like it was a really weird, weird moment because I felt like there was definitely change in music and there was something going on, but there was no clubs that played like this sort of mid-tempo music, you know what I mean? You, you either had like grime stuff that was going on, like real urban clubs, or you had like dance clubs that played like, you know, just like trancey, housey kind of dance music. Like Fabric at the time was, you know, which is Dave's now resident, sort of, he runs a once a month thing at Fabric, this club in London. And they've become like a supporters, a supporter of this sort of sound. And they have artists that are part of this scene to play. And how do you describe that sound? What is I that sound? I don't know. I still don't know. I mean, somebody told me that when I started writing, they said, oh, you don't have to come up with a name because the journalists do that for you. And then, like, no one really mm. thought about it, and I think that became my whole thing. They were like, what the fuck is it? And I was like, okay, that's kind of cool. After like three, four times, you, you, I, I thought they'd think of something, but no one has. But There definitely is a wider association, certainly in the press in terms of, and musically as well, in terms of you know DJs like Switch and Sindon and Diplo, Holotronic, Slow B, and you know artists such as yourself and maybe even an artist like spank rock and you know it that is like recognized as a scene do you feel boxed in by that or you know does that make it more powerful no i don't feel boxed in i think it's important to have i think when you make new music it's definitely important to to people are always going to be inspired and it's good to have like some sort of thing going on and um I don't know, it's it's interesting though, but in Eng England it just didn't happen at the time when I was making it, so it was really, really difficult. And I think here in America, it was, it was it, it already started, not here. Canada. I know, not here. It's because it's I'm flying. North America. And I flew here today. But uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, in America it was already happening and I, I kind of caught that time, like it was it was some weird timing, and um, but now in London it is so big, like everywhere you go, every club plays exactly that sort of piracy funds terrorism style thing. You know, you have like Baltimore club, you got Bali Funk, you got dance or you got you know it's just like a real mishmash of stuff, yeah. and. Um, I mean, but those musics that you just mentioned are from far-flung corners of the gro globe, you know. Bailey Funk true, from Brazil, Balt Baltimore House, you know, like even Crunk, Hyphy, all of those things seem to go into the pot. Yeah. Is is. I mean, to me, I thought it was quite an obvious thing. You just play what you like, and if you have a diverse taste, then it makes sense. But I think as a producer, it was really difficult, like, as producers go in England, it was difficult to meet people who are really open-minded. And Dave was the first person that I met who was really open-minded, who could also like develop at the pace of whatever 
this thing was moving at, you know? And, you know, you could bring people to Dave and he gets it and he'll sort of try and do the best with it and stuff. And I found that really inspiring and really reflect, refreshing, which is why I wanted to work with him. Because you could take him anywhere and, you know, dump him in the middle of nowhere and be like, here's a stick, make me a beat. And he can, he can do that or you can introduce him to someone you know, that makes like really amazing music and he, he, he can find his way around it. It's, it's really good. Talking so. of which, you've both recently been in the studio with Timberland, is that correct? No. No? Oh, I bumped into him and you, you said that you're going to be working with Timberland. Is that not true? Um, I did on, on Kala, okay. yeah. And he's been working with Tricky at the right. moment in LA. And um, yeah, I think, I think Wes, we're, um, said that he's working with Missy, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so that's Dave Switch, and he came with me and sort of produced most of the album with me. And then, I don't know, what do you want me to play next? Something he did. This is, this is I think, this is Dave's, I think this is Dave's best work, this one. I think in that one, it's really obvious what I was listening to at the time. Um, well, it's the Pixie song. It kind of came back because it's the only one I know how to play on the guitar, but not that one, the Gigantic song. And um, so I think I was just like messing around and then, you know, it that song is really amazing to me. and. It just kind of happened. We we were actually we put that together in a hotel room in India, and um, I think I had like two hours before I flew somewhere else, and it came together so quickly. Like it just didn't. I didn't. I didn't really question anything. It just did it, and I was in a rush. And we we got like somebody from the hotel to come and like whistle on the track and stuff, and she got fired. So we were all really pissed off. Like. The manager fired her like half an hour before and stuff, so we were trying to get a job back. And so it was kind of, um, yeah, it's just one of those things. I think I think sometimes when songs come together in like an hour or whatever, is is usually the best. And there are the songs that I kind of work on forever, and you know I never actually make it finish it or do anything with. And it's one of those songs. It's just like a quick painless thing um i wanted to just make maybe i should just play you something random i wanted to play you like mine and dave's favorite song this is how we bonded because he's so not the type of person that i'd work with and uh why not i don't know he's just so like dave's come come dave comes from this place called essex and <laughs> it's like not <laughs> great <laughs> But you know, he's like a real like <laughs> geezer. Yeah, he's a real geezer and stuff. But when I was young, um, I used to like hang out in East London, which is kind of like on the way to Essex. And that's kind of where XR2 comes from, hanging out with like these Bengali gang gangs and stuff. And we used to go raving all the time and and this was our favourite song and and when I, yeah, when I was 15, this was my favorite song. And Dave is the only person who knew it and had the song. So that's how we bonded. But I want, I want to play this song to you because musically, I think it's the best thing. Like I never, I wanted to make something like this for my album, but I couldn't go there because I think you have to like be insane to make it. And I knew that if I'd gone there, I'd never come back. And like, when you're a musician, there's only three things that, someone said there's only three things that could happen to you. And one is you become a drug addict, and two is you go insane, and three is you get hyper-spiritual. And this one kind of made me think that I was gonna go there with madness, so I stopped. But this is seven minutes long, and I wanna play the whole track, because I think you have to live it. And 
so when I was like, you know, really young, when you hear it and you walk into a club, it was like the most amazing feeling. Like at 14, I used to sort of like jump out of four story high buildings and stuff just to make it to a club because, you know, I know my mom didn't let me out and stuff. But this gave me the strength to do shit like that. You know, <laughs> you think you can fly and stuff. And it's probably the longest verse ever wrapped on a beat. And it breaks records for me. So here we go. <laughs> so that's called Narrow Minds. Who's it by? Uh, Genocide 2. And the track's called Narrow Minds. It's really, really rare. Like, I, I just, I've never heard it since that time in my life. And, um, and what, what time was that in your life? The Exile Two Days. <laughs> I think it was like, yeah, 1992, and I was just kind of raving loads. And, you know, with, with all the other sort of rave songs, you can always find them anywhere, but this one's really, really rare. And, um, but I felt like after that, I just didn't want to say anything. Like, it, it made me think really different about lyrics and stuff. Like, you know, every time I, I listen to that in the studio, I just kind of, just kind of, it shuts me down lyrically and stuff. And I just want to put it on repeat and <laughs> listen to someone else's song. So that, I think, is one of the songs that I was listening to loads. And... Where are you I living at this point? Sh maybe I should just play you, like, some music around that time in London. I think, in, you know, England was such a really... It's a special place for... I think pushing limits and making music that's kind of, um, you know, they, I don't, I don't know, it just felt like they're just more experimental and it's sort of not so precious, you know what I mean? It doesn't seem so like, um, I don't know, people that make sort of all the fringe stuff around, like the industry stuff, it, it has more, I don't know, to me it has more experimentation going on and I think like with Bambi Banger, that's one of the things that I was I was also thinking about. Like, I just kind of wanted to be like, fuck you about everything. Like, I didn't want to make sense. I didn't want to write like proper sentences. I didn't want to write like verses you're supposed to write. And, you know, especially I think me as an artist, um, at that time in the newspapers and stuff, people were like, MIA is banned. And, you know, over my lyrics and it was, my mum was reading shit like that. And it's kind of, I think, you know, for me, I just felt like communication just can't be like that. I shouldn't have to rap the same as Eminem or I shouldn't have to like rap the way Kanye West raps and shit just to be a rapper, you know what I mean? Like that, those kind of definitions really I don't know, I find it really limiting and, and that, that's why I like this Narrow Mind song because it's just like that guy who, who delivers on that track, you can, you can hear like how insane he is, you know what I mean? And I don't think if you go, if you go that far in it, I don't think you can last. And, and you know, you get to a point where you snap and I, I didn't want to sort of, in my music and stuff, when I talk about things, I just don't want to kind of say it all and sort of burn out and snap by the end of it. I think it's a, it's a bigger fight than that, if, if there is one. And as an artist, I have to keep things kind of 360 and make sure that you spread it out in your work, you know, in the art, in the film, in the stuff you do not just music and the lyric and, you know, what you say in a verse. And I think Bambi Banger was the first song that I I wanted to open it up like that to myself and and be like, I just want to say random words that I've seen in the, you know, past six months of my life through everything that I've I've seen and done and wherever I've gone. And it doesn't it, it could just be abstract like that. And it kind of feeds in through the music and the art and the film and, you know, just mm -hmm. lifestyle or whatever's going on at the time. And I think, yeah, it, 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 
it's sort of difficult for people. And when I played it to people first and I brought it into the record company and they're like, but we need a hit. And, you know, I think, I think that kind of is the battle. You know what I mean? Everyone's like, God, I wish you'd just work with Timberland and come up with a hit. And I was coming up with Bambi Banger, which kind of doesn't really say anything and keeps things really abstract and stuff. And yeah, I think it was inspired by this track somehow. I don't know. I can't really tell now. But you mentioned um, music, textile, art, film. I know that you know you've got a background in both visual art and textiles, and also cinema as well as well as music. Is there a, is there a pecking order for you? Where does music come in the in the priority list? There is music number one, or is it all just art to you? Is it all the same? Well, I think, you know, it's obviously it's the dominant sort of factor in my life. It dictates uh, what I do every day. And, you know, I'm, I'm traveling and touring and I'm, I'm being a musician. But I try not to, I try not to see music as a musician, though. I think it's really important for me to just stay human first. And, you know, you have to see yourself as an artist. And then, and then the medium is the second, you know, it's a secondary thing. So you kind of have to develop as a person and get your vibe in check, you know, because I think musically it really helps if you have like a thing. And if you have a thing, then you can do it in whatever you do it in. You know, if you, if you were the person that, that made soft drinks, you could still have that same flavor. <laughs> and, and I think, um, you know, it, it, it is what I'm doing, but at the same time, I think I, think I kind of know that there's going to be ups and downs and weird limitations around what I do, and I kind of sense it, you know, definitely more on this album than the first one. And on the first one, like, I, I wanted to make... A, a political a political album because I think it was necessary for the time I made it in, and now I just want to do it to be annoying, and you know it it really feels like since Arula on this album like I have so much more like you know trouble with immigration and just trouble generally and in, in random you know every time I enter a country I have to sign like special sheets that talk about freedom of speech and uh, you know whether it's what are the, i mean what kind of lyrics have put you in that situation well i don't even know if it's the lyrics the thing is it's you know my immigration problem stuff is kind of more to do with i think my dad and um because i i just don't buy it like i don't think that you could get in trouble for saying plo which is just bullshit. and i've heard like wu-tang say it like a thousand times and you know, if it really is about sort of being able to say things if you're an American citizen and then you can't say certain things if you're a non-citizen, that, that's just a bullshit lesson to learn. But either way, like I wanted to use my music to kind of highlight these things and, and, and to see if there were limitations to freedom of speech. And, and, and I think on this album, even though I wasn't so, I don't think I'm directly political or anything, but I have more problem problems. And I think that's why most of, I think lyrically and stuff, what I was trying to do is just keep it sort of, you know, keep it in a way that, that, that told me things, you know what I mean? You put certain things out and they're like codes and, and, how people react to certain things, you know, you could you could get it back and it's something else that you build, you know? That's kind of how I was thinking when I was making this album. I was like, this album isn't like, oh, here's my music, I'm making music and this is an album and here are my songs and this is what I learned in production, this is what I learned as an artist, this is what I am as a performer. It wasn't, it was kind of, there are a few things I need to find out about the planet and how this shit works and, you know, what's important, what's not important, what's important to teach people, what's important to learn as a human being. And you... It, it's like a, a stepping stone for me on this album. So you kind of build up sort of 
codes or structures and stuff, and it's in the making. And and so depending on this, I wanted to figure out what I was going to do next. And I don't know if that's music, you know. So. And, and have you found? That, uh, I'm sure my. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Uh, do you find, you know, have you found that, like, as you've blown up in North America as a kind of cool UK artist and being seen that way, and as cer certainly an artist that um, is very popular in the fashion press and is arguably seen as fashionable, that that somehow has undermined your ability to get your message across and the fact that it diverted people's attention away from the fact that you are actually saying something quite important and political in your records? Um... No, because I think it's all part of it, you know. And I think for me, like, it's just important. I think if I, if I, I would, I would never ever be that artist, you know, who's going to be like straight up, like one dimensional political. And it's like, my whole thing wasn't, oh, I'm a politician. It's like, I'm a civilian, just certain fucked up shit happened to me and I'm going to talk about it. And sometimes, you know, it's not even like in a ruler, only like, you know, three, four songs are about that, you know what I mean? The rest is kind of like $10 and stuff, it's got nothing to do with it. And there's loads of songs on there that's kind of got nothing to do with it. But it's also my history and stuff, but... Do you want to mention that? Because you mentioned your dad before, but it might be best to put that in context for people that don't understand what you're referring to. Well, um, <laughs> my dad... He basically he was a revolutionary in the seventies and stuff. So I grew up in Sri Lanka, and when I got to England, blah blah blah, so much stuff happened. But when the Iraqi war was going on, I just felt like it was really stupid because I went to Sri Lanka that year and actually got to know exactly the ins and outs of what was going on. Like there was like a systematic genocide. Uh, the Tamil people were like banned from doing the census report, which means technically you can wipe out a whole race without having to account for them. So they were shrinking in numbers and the population was just like sort of phasing out. And when the people tried to come and tell me, whether it was like Amnesty International people or just random people that just had shit happen to them, and they were like really horrible stories. And so I filmed all this stuff and I got into so much trouble and it kind of seeped into my music because that's where my headspace was at the time. You know, 2001, I went off to do that, came back and it was just in my head and I was just like, wow, uh, the Tamil people are banned from talking to the press, which means they can't actually ever be heard by anyone. So I had this sort of footage, like a hundred hours of footage of people telling me stuff and I couldn't get it into a film shape and get it past the uh, Sri Lankan um, embassy because they have to clear um, any films or any sort of work you make about the Sri Lankan political situation, you have to have it approved by the embassy and they wouldn't approve it for me. And so I became an artist because of that and sort of made it into stills and things like that just to get around that. And I think every, every time you morph into a different form of a creative person, most of the time it's because I needed to get around this, you know, a situation. And um, I think that just sort of led into, you know, bled into music. And at the time when I was making music, I kind of am a life experience artist, you know what I mean? And that's, I think, is one of the important things to teach people, that you have to, if you get your inspiration from the shit that happens to you, then no one can really tell you shit, you know? And also, you never run out of it, you know? It's like, it's just a bag of fuel, and you just have it forever if you sort of learn to get good at sort of using yourself. And um, and I think that's kind of how I was thinking about it. And when I made music, I just wanted to tell people, look, this is happening, that's going on, this is how I felt, this is, I'm confused, I was here, da da da, -da this happened, that happened. It was more like that, it was just sharing something you'd gone through. And it, it grew 
into me actually, you know, ending up on the Homeland Security threat list. And <laughs> so I became like national threat to Homeland Security and they red coded me and didn't let me in for 10 months, which is really stupid. And that that kind of was the point though, I thought, to 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 stress that there is a limitation to freedom of speech. And if there was a floor and a ceiling to freedom of speech, then we, we, we shouldn't have kind of gone and bombed, you know, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people in Iraq for it. You know what I mean? That was like one of the things we were fighting for. So anyway, here I am. <laughs> you, you mentioned um, before, you just mentioned before, um, the piracy funds terrorism sound. You were like, is that whole piracy funds terrorism sound? What, what did you mean by that? That's to do with the mixtape you did, right? Early on? Or yeah, I mean, I always used to say, you know, when you go to um, a club, it should sound like a mixtape and stuff, you know? Just just in terms of the sound of having Baltimore and Bali Funk or, you know, Kuduru, wh whatever it is, ha like, be able to happen in one space. So you didn't go to like, a funk club, then you went to a Kuduru club, you know? that you can have it all play in the same space. That's kind of what I meant. But that was that was the, the thing that kicked it off for you before the first album, right? Before you went to Excel, that, that tape? No, I made that after I made Aurilla. Okay. I, I made Galang and it was a, I put it out as a white label and then I was working in a shop and it was getting already played on the radio and stuff and DJs were calling me, you know, like BBC Radio and stuff. And they're like, hey, I like your song. And I was like, that's 26 99 please. And yeah, I kind of became a musician after that because I couldn't fight it, you know, so. Let's hear that. It was a, U it was a underground hit in the UK. I think it went to number seven in the charts in Canada in the same <laughs> year, so. Have you been studying the charts? Yeah, I have. I don't study the charts. I hope I have it. How's the line? So how did that one affect, that was the big one, right? That was when Excel called you up after that one. Yeah. So Excel basically, I was living down the street and they were the closest record company to my house. And I was that poor. And so I just went to them because I could walk it there. And I played them that song and they kind of signed me and stuff. And, you know, at that time I had like four songs demoed. And then I finished the album and then I came to America and worked, worked with Diplo and made Power and Sequence Terrorism. And I don't know, you know, on this album, I felt like when I was making Arulo, it was just so simple. Like, I just started, like, Glang was the second song that like, I ever wrote as a song. And the, the first one I wrote is M.I.A. And it, it kind of was really weird that it was the first time I sort of sat on a four track and wrote a song start to finish. And, you know, loads of the noises came off the 505. And it was really difficult, though, because I didn't really want to be a singer, and I, I really thought that I was going to have issues like remembering my words and stuff. And just, you know, I, I kind of didn't want to be a performer. I scouted like loads of people to be the uh, singer of that song. And I demoed it with like three other girls. And in the end, my demo actually became the track. And I was just trying to fight it as long as possible, having to sort of become a singer. And yeah, it, I think on this album, I had to sort of get away from that sort of thing and become more, I had to think about it more like an artist. And I think this, this whole album, Kala, like, a, I was having immigration problems, so that became like this sort of nagging thing in my head, which was making me have to like travel all these places, but I just wanted to stay at home. 
And I moved out of my place in like 2005 and just was on the road. And making this album sort of kept me on the road. So I kind of haven't gone home since 2005. And I had to make it a creative process and just because I was so desperate to get into a house and, you know, whether you're like painting a picture or you're making something, you just want to have your work spread out and you, you kind of want shit everywhere and the mess everywhere and you want to be able to sort of think and have thought processes and see it and go to sleep, wake up the next day and, you know, follow where you were and stuff. But it's really difficult to do that when you can't really... Like, I had no work, I couldn't access anything. You know, my apartment was just sort of like a, a no-go area. And I didn't have just things that inspire you, you know, around you and stuff. So the process became, like, the most important thing, you know. So I think I, think I had to make that as creative as possible. But um, being an art, coming from a visual artist background, you know, what is, what's more important to you, the process or the final product it's definitely the process and it you know I'm just really grateful when people say they like the album because to me it was really the process and if people like the outcome that's really cool but at the time when I was making it it really is about you know sort of being able to think certain things and like some of the songs I worked on it in every single country I went to just because, you know what I mean? Like you wanted to add layers and layers and layers. It was kind of like making, you know, a cake or something. And then then you sliced it into songs. So it was, you know, you, you get the drums. I recorded all the drums in India, but that's kind of all I recorded. And like a couple other instruments that I knew I was definitely gonna use. And then I went to Trinidad and recorded like the atmosphere of it, I think, like the vibe of it came from there. And, you know, subject matter is probably more like Liberia. And then, you know, sort of the bass sounds were probably England, you know what I mean? It was just like layers of shit. And um, I don't know, it just felt like, I was making this whole thing and at the time, you know, I was also making the artwork just from what I was seeing around in all these places and 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 I couldn't really carry too much shit around because it was just me on my own and I'd go to different countries and set up teams there on the spot just from people I met and stuff. So certain places I went, I, I just really didn't know anyone there and you, you kind of have to make the connections and build up things right there and then on the spot. So that became like the thing. Like, okay, you've got like blah, 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 days in this place. Like how good are you gonna be at meeting, you know, people that are like-minded and sort of get to what you need to get to, you know? And um, I don't know, all these things are just sort of, I just wanted to keep my sort of mind busy, I think. and. I always felt like, but any minute now, I'm gonna work with Timberland, and that's the real album, you know what I mean? And I think I think now and again, because I didn't really have any access to the record companies and stuff, and no one from, no one from Interscope and Excel kind of had any contact with me until I'd sort of made like 10 tr tracks for the album. So I don't know, I just kind of really felt like I was in the wilderness with it. Or, but it was trying to sort of be using the world as like your big studio, you know what I mean? And talking of which, I mean, recording all of that stuff in so many different locations, what, what equipment do you use? What software do you use to do that? What makes your life easiest in terms of when you're laying down drums in India and then recording vocals elsewhere? You, you mentioned that you did that track with Dave in the hotel room. Yeah, no, we just had this laptop. And wherever I go, I hire speakers, you know. Like in Trinidad, I went and rented a, a little spot and it was next to like a football pitch where they have like, you know, Saturdays and Sundays, they have like parties and stuff and sports day shit going on. So I just kind of went to one of the parties and the DJs who were there, I just asked if, if I could rent the speakers of them once they're done 
with the party and so I just had like outdoor speakers like you know normal shitty speakers and then I so I, I kind of set it up outside on the porch in the front yard bit and that's where we made like boys and stuff so you know in the back you can hear the atmosphere like on far far um the song which is like a bonus track on uh the japanese version this i think you can really hear the atmosphere on this because you're when because yeah it's really difficult to get we were playing the tr track, the beat off through the speakers, and we didn't have headphones and stuff, and we didn't have mic stands or, you know, just anything. We were just making it on the fly. So we were playing it in the speakers and singing, and you can hear it sort of double tracked and triple tracked, and, you know, the crickets were getting quadruple tracked, because every time you do like a layer of vocal take or whatever, everything was getting tracked twice as much in the music. So it started automatically having like a weird sound. And on this track, I think you could tell the most, the vocal sounds, you know, it, it really is about when I recorded it. Sorry. Anyway, on that one, you can really tell, like the sound is really affected by your environment. Um, well, Log Logic? Yes, logic. logic. Yeah. yeah. That's it, actually. We just use logic. At one point, when we recorded um, in the cupboard, uh, like A.R. Rahman, he used to come down and send his people and stuff to spy on us. And that was their thing. They were in like the um, you know, $11 million studio and we were in the cupboard and stuff. And they always used to be like, how do you do that? Like, we're one guy and one computer. You know what I mean? And he had like 800 sort of like piece orchestras and stuff. And I think um, it's just sort of like being brave, you know, and, and just not giving a shit and not limiting yourself to anything and, and being able to make music out of anything, you know? And that was like the idea. And this is, this is I wanted to play this Kaduru track because this I think inspired me a lot when I was making the album. Um, this is kind of what I played to Tim Lan and he just didn't want to know. Um. Anyway. Where's that, where's that from? So that, that's from Angola. And basically, you know, when you see like how far they're able to push it and that's like street music. Like Kaduru comes from, you know, the most underground, you know what I mean? It's, is is you'd think that there there wouldn't be that much progression in it, but if if you know if people with that much to say can experiment with like mute rappers and stuff like that, I just felt really weird being in Timberland's studio, kind of you know worrying about whether I'm in like perfect tune and pitch and stuff like that, you know, and. So I think that's kind of, that that made me go out on, in my own direction with things, you know? And yeah, it was, it was a, I, I think it's an inspiring track. Did you want to hear like more Kuduru stuff or? Okay, this is, um, this track is by DJ Zenobia, who's like my favorite DJ at the moment. And, um, he, I was gonna go to Angola and work with him, but he got into a car crash, and he was in a coma for like a month. And but now he's back out and he's making music again, which is good. I like that song. Okay, I have to play you this other song that 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 it it feels like narrow minds to me, but this is like from India. And it's an old song. I think it's probably like 1989, 1990. And um, it's really, the sound of it is really amazing. I, I just have like a cheap rip from like a VCD. I found it on like a music, um, what do you call it? Like a music video VCD thing in India in the market. But I loved it. 
and this is like their structure. So um, I don't know. It's really storytelling, -y and I really like I really like that. And I don't think there's enough of it in dance music. <laughs> How important is um, video in terms of your music and expressing your music through video? And uh, how much of a hand in your own music videos do you have? Um, certain ones, I mean, like bird flu and stuff, you know. At that time when I made it, I was in India and I kind of wanted to contain that as a whole project, you know. Mm. And so that was kind of, I don't know, it, it had to come from there. And I think at that time I didn't have a manager and stuff as well. So I was really sort of like totally like reeling out of control. And I was like, hi, I need more money. And then, you know, it was just about working out how to sort of start something out of scratch and build it. And the video ended up being an extension, you know, of the song. and. We, we, we made clothes and the kids got involved and, you know, it was just like, it was really fun. So that ended up being what it was and totally, like, 100%, like, just my thing. But there are certain videos, like, with Jimmy, it's like a video that I wanted to just hand over to someone else and go, if you're going to make, like, you know, it, it was kind of like like a piss take at the Wacker company because they were always like, you should make like a shiny video, you know? And I think I was like, fine, I'll just hand that song over to someone because I made that song as like a piss take for the Wacker company, you know? Because they kept saying, but you need to make a hit. So I just wanted to make like a song that sounded really super sort of pop. And I wanted a video like that as well. And I think I didn't want to have any hand in it just so that I could see, you know, how they would dress me and how they would shoot me and, you know, by the end of it, I kind of thought I'll end up with a video that I could put speech bubbles on and exactly explain what was going on. But I kind of, yeah, got into other things by then. And um, I'm going to make a Paper Planes video. So that, that one, I think I'm going to sort of just keep it to what the song was about and how, how I came to that song, you know? What, what is that and song about? Well, it's about lots of stuff. But one of the things was when I moved to Brooklyn, I live in this neighborhood called Bed-Stuy, and bed is really interesting because it's got like this real like new African community that's moved in there. And they live on top of like the hip hop community that had been there. and and. That part of Brooklyn is really famous because I guess like Biggie and Jay Z and Little Kim and everyone comes from there and stuff. But the new African immigrants, there's a lot of like Bengalis, Senegalese, like Somalians and stuff. They, those communities, they don't really care about the hip hop element, you know, that exists there, and they've built their whole new thing on it, and it's really, really like concentrated, you know a real like intense neighborhood. And it kind of comes from that, like just, I don't know, the most intimidating thing an immigrant can say when they come over uh, is, I don't know, I just feel like the most, it's, it's just one of those sentences, the most cliched thing that everybody always says is, oh, they're just going to come and take our money and come and take our jobs. You know what I mean? That's like how it, how it is in England, and it's always like the most said thing. And it kind of comes from that, to, to see all these people, and they're really vibrant and amazing, and they totally add to the culture. And they really have like a sense of community in, in, in the middle of, you know, New York, which is a really weird thing because it seems like quite a, like a, it's like a real sort of, I don't know, a third world thing that's happening in, in the most sort of, you know, developed, um, I don't know, metropolitan city. And that it kind of comes from ha trying to mash those two things up and, you know, making making it more sort of easier to understand 
Yeah. So what are you going to do for the video for that one? I'm working at a hoagie shop, like selling. Well, it's not a shop. It's kind of, I've got a, a hoagie stand. <coughs> yeah, I think. And if you, if you could pick any cinema directors to work with, be it for music videos or any other kind of visual media, who would, who would you choose and why? I don't know. Right now, I think it's a really weird time in music. Like, I don't, I don't even know if it's important to make a video. I think, I, I kind of I do think it's important, but it's not important to make a video in the same structures as, like, MTV set out. You know, I don't think MTV itself plays music videos anymore. And I think it's really difficult because Spike Jones was supposed to shoot the Paper Planes video originally, and, you know, we've been talking about it for months. And we started shooting bits of it and stuff. And in the end, it just seemed like, you know, Spike wanted to make, he, he always felt like I don't come across enough in my work and in my videos. And he, he just wanted to try and shoot something that was more real. And I think it's just, to me, it just feels like I haven't, I haven't quite worked it out, you know. find it one bag's a mess one, one thing i was going to ask you is about internet and and you know how <laughs> how off in a minute <laughs> how um you know around the kind of galang period and and when you started making first started making music how important was internet and myspace and all that kind of stuff to 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 what you do and, and getting your message across um Honestly speaking, at, in the beginning, it wasn't... I mean, it's important to... It's kind of... Imp as a person, it wasn't really important to me. Yeah. I never sort of spent time on the internet and stuff. And, um, like, honestly speaking, in England, I think 60% of the working class don't have a computer still, you know? So if you're talking about, like, street music and stuff, I don't know, those kids are not on the internet, you know what I mean? Yeah, like if you go into middle England and stuff like that, and I, I think I always sort of felt that it might change me and it might change the way I think if I opened it up. But then when I made Galang, like that's like the main way it spread. And, you know, and then I began to sort of embrace it afterwards, thinking, shit, that's exactly like what we need to do. Like when you go to Liberia and stuff, like that's like the most important thing you can actually show someone and give someone, you know. Like I have problems with Black Star. It, it's like chaos, like working with Black Star because he doesn't have like emails. He doesn't have, you know, like you can't actually contact him, and just Where, where's Black Star? Black Star's from Baltimore and who made the turn with me. Um, and he's amazing as a producer, he's just so amazing. But he has like real life I like issues, you know what I mean? You go there, every time I go down to Baltimore to work with him, he's in jail. And I have to like bail him out, I spend like days waiting for him. It's the only ever, like time I ever call the lawyers and stuff at Interscope and you know, and they're like, what it's like i need to get someone out of jail <laughs> like could you call someone and i think he's just yeah i always think that i was like if he had an internet thing set up and he can control his myspace and blah 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 he'd probably get out there more you know if he was on aim and he was sending files like that's how someone like diplo works you know what i mean he's really internet based as a person and and, you know, that's the thing about, like, like if you go into certain places and certain areas of music, like, like for example, Kuduru in Angola, like those kids getting them to communicate with the rest of the world and the pace that we move in is really, really difficult, you know. And I think how we, in the West, how we're developing music and dance culture and the culture that whatever this thing is, it's so internet-based, and it and it 
and it's so fast and it works on remix cultures, it works on DJs, it works on all those things. And they're, they're part of it, but you, you either have to like open up the you know, travel thing and build more bridges that way, or this is the only other bridge you have, you know, to be able to sort of share things. So, yeah. I mean, it's how do you meet the people, these people that inspire you then? Because, I mean, you mentioned Diplo, you mentioned <coughs> someone from Baltimore, you mentioned people in Angola. If these people are not people that you're communicating with on Instant Messenger or MySpace or email, how do you, how did you meet go Diplo there. and all these I people? I mean, I go there, but, like, but most... How do, you, how, do you, how do you contact them and say, let's work together in the first place? How did you, how did you bump into them in the first place? Well, Diplo, I went to the club, and... Um, you know, Baltimore, I, like Black Star, went there to his house, and I mean, I tend to. I mean, that is how I meet people. Like, you you hear stuff and you track them down and go there, or you wait until they 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 sort of somewhere near you. But Black Star's never going to sort of be in London or anything like that. And and I think. Yeah, going to Angola and stuff is really, really hard because of the situation. Like, you, you also have that kind of shit to deal with, you know. Like, in Liberia, they don't have electricity, let alone a computer. And I just... Um, I don't know. It just kind of happens. Yeah. <laughs> MIA. Missing in action or missing in acting? It's missing in acting but it doesn't really wash anywhere else outside London, so. <laughs> Any questions from the floor? <laughs> um, just a question, like you produce these tunes with Others and by yourself as well, do you? Like, you know what I mean? Like, do you produce some solo, some of them? Um, I think on Arula I did more, like, sort of solo stuff. And I usually tend to have ideas, say, if you make something on the 505, then I take it out of my space and, you know, then I get people to add whatever they need to on it. Like, Galang is kind of like that. Like, I kind of made it on a 505, and then um, Steve Mackey and Ross Orton, they helped me sort of add, like, uh, the bass line and the Moog stuff, all the analogy sounds, you know, because I kind of don't have loads of equipment. So, yeah, it kind of comes out of just, I don't know, it's kind of random sometimes. No, but with not. Switch... He initially came on the project as a technician, like I wanted him to do all the technical programming stuff. And, but it's not that clear cut. Like, you know, I think when you're in the moment and you're making something, it's, it's really important that you just create and not think about shit like that. And, you know, you just have to let it evolve and go wherever it needs to go and then sort it out afterwards, you know? Yeah, yep. uh, and also, like how much of it, like it's really, sound really raw, I find your production and your tunes and I like that. Um, uh, and how much of that, like when you're writing tunes, like how much, like is it all just, like a lot of it's just off the vibe, you know, what you're feeling, like how much goes in, how much effort do you put into like, you know, fine tuning your sounds, like EQing sounds and, and your mixes and stuff and like, and what percentage of it goes in, of your energy goes into that as opposed to what energy goes in just into the vibes of, of your tunes? I think on this one I fine-tuned quite a lot, you know. On a ruler, there's just like nothing. I think even even like Bucky, like Wes, he sent me like emailed me the loops of, you know, the verses and stuff in Bucky, and we just kind of I went into a studio that I'd never been in before, and I used like a technician that I'd never met before and pieced it together and it, it was just really, I think I wrote the lyrics in a cab on the way to the studio and stuff and, you know, Wes came down and he spent like two hours in the studio on, on in transit to Paris or something and it was just really sort of 
scrappy but at that time when I was making a reel I was just always like it's just a sketchbook I'm just making a sketchbook of shit that I'm thinking about while I'm learning about music because that whole album I didn't know shit about music you know and I, I was a fan but I never wanted to make it and then I discovered a tool and it was just like having a toy and you want to like test out the limitations and that's what it was to me like that whole album so it was really scrappy and, and and sort of yeah, there was nothing sort of uh, solid in the in the way we produced it, you know. But on this one, I think we fine tuned quite a lot only because I was traveling loads and bringing up the files in loads of different places, and me and Switch would, you know, get together. Uh, after a while of him sort of going off and doing his own thing and then he'll meet me somewhere else and da 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 and we kept going like that. So we got to work on songs quite a lot, you know, and look at things again and again. So, yeah. All right, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Firstly, the 505 is the actual groove box MC505. Yeah. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, just to, just to get it clear. And uh, what is exactly, exactly your relationship with Brazilian music and Bailey Funk and that kind of thing? My relationship? Um, I think I'm just, you know, at that time... I was just a huge fan and I, I'd never gone to Brazil and stuff. And then when, after I made Bucky, like the sound kind of exploded in London and now you can get loads of like fun clubs and stuff. And it was just, I was just really into, I just believed in it and I wanted to like, I want people in London, London to hear it, you know? And yeah, it was just about sort of spreading the, the noise and when I got there they they said in Brazil like Bali Funk had never made it on MTV and Bucky was the first time that they'd played Bali Funk on MTV you know and and the Brazilians were like well how come it takes an outsider to bring our music to MTV that's bullshit like they should have yeah. they should have had more support like yeah and so now I think they play more funk videos and stuff and they've started supporting it and stuff. So that was kind of cool. And yeah, it was really bizarre when I went there. I went to like the Sugarloaf Mountain and it was like, I got chased by like a hundred screaming 14 year old girls like on my first day and it just hit me like what that meant, you know what I mean? And before then I was just sort of in London going, trying to convince people of like this music and stuff. And I don't know, I, I love Brazil and that whole vibe. I just think the, the funk infrastructure probably has to uh, shift and mold into some other shape because when I went there, I just found that like DJ Marlboro kind of had a lot of power and funk and loads of music and musicians have to kind of go through him. So the way it spread was kind of weird and the way it changed wasn't, it wasn't, um, I don't know, positive enough. You know what I mean? It just felt like there was no money to keep the, the real kids in, in the favelas who are really, really poor, who, who could make money out of that, wasn't actually, getting fed off it enough, like that you, you'd actually have to work your ass off doing shows and touring. And Daisy Jagrona, who, who made the Injeco song, which, you know, Bucky's like inspired by, she does like five shows a night and she she's like eight months pregnant and was still performing two days before the baby came. And the day after she gave birth, she was back on stage and like, you know, breastfeeding the baby on stage. And that's how hard you have to work. And it's just, I think the infrastructure has to change a little bit for, for the music to actually help properly, you know? And 
I don't know. So that that I don't know. I hope I I did something constructive for for funk. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, you're doing. Thanks. All right. Um, what pushed you to to start uh, making international collabs? You know, all this traveling, and does your label support you, or do they try to sit you with one person? Because they, uh, it seems like you're traveling a lot to do this music. And no, I traveled loads because I didn't get a visa to come home. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't want to stay in London because I actually didn't have a home there. So I was on people's couches, and is really shit and boring sometimes. It rained all the time, so I was like, I've already done a ruler like pretty much based in London. I just didn't want to make the same album twice, you know? And the difference between a ruler and Kala was that I had money, you know? So if you're gonna spend like 100 grand and buy a beat of like Polo the Don, I might as well give that 100 grand to like a whole bunch of people around the planet and just try and do something else. And I just figured even if the songs turned out shit, it's all right to just kind of spread or spend money differently. You know what I mean? I think that's what it is. You just have to build new templates of spending money in, in, in the music industry. But no one really tells me what to do in the industry because they've never had a Sri Lankan rapper. So I'm like, you don't know and I don't know. So we're both equal, you know what I mean? There's no point in them telling me what to do because it's not like, yeah, they have a template, you know what I mean? And I think the music industry really works like that. You're screwed if there's somebody else who's been before that is like you, you know? And your fight is harder with them, but if there isn't, you could pretty much say whatever you want and get away with it. And yeah, they kind of, it's, it's kind of good to have a bank, but in terms of like what I make, it's sort of in the air, you know. I've just been told we've got to let you go to sound check, so um, I'm afraid that's it. But uh, um, what time are you on stage tonight? I have no idea, 11, oh. And we've got um, Hudson Mo and Sam I Am playing tonight as well. I'm looking forward to it very much. But now say thank you very much for joining us today. Bye. Thanks.